thousands of years after its main volcanic formation, no human beings lived on the island that we know today as Dominica. The forests grew luxuriantly down to the water's edge and to the summits of the tallest mountains. Then, some 5,000 years ago, the first people arrived in this part of the Caribbean from South America. They were hunters and gatherers who collected food from the forests and the surrounding shores. They were followed at about the time of Christ, 2,000 years ago, by new groups of people who practiced agriculture and made pottery out of clay. They arrived along the islands from South America with their families and plants and animals and established a new island culture which was adapted from their life on the mainland continent. They entered an island of rich natural resources, of fertile river valleys and bountiful marine life along the shore and on the coral reefs and out on the open sea. We know about their past because of the work of archaeologists who find the remains of their villages and material culture and study these artifacts so as to understand the way that these Amerindian people lived long ago. They lived entirely off the resources of the land and from the sea and neighboring islands. They cultivated plants that they brought from South America, sweet potato, popo, pineapple and tobacco among others. Many of their tools were made from pieces of stone which were shaped into axes and hoes by grinding them on rocks near the seashore. The conch was a very important source of food, but the conch shell also provided material for jewelry, sacred objects and tools. Grinders for making ground corn or for pounding herbs were also carved from stone and chips of jasper were used to make the important cassava graters for processing their staple food. The last group of Amerindian people to come here called themselves the Kalinago, and their name for the island was Wai Tukubuli, meaning tall is her body. These Kalinago continued to practice the culture of the early island people, and many of their practices survive today. Their most important possession was the canoe, for it was used to navigate along the island chain and for fishing and raiding. The canoe is carved from the tall, straight trunk of the gommier tree, using a variety of tools such as the axe, hatchet and adze. Stones and water are then placed in the dugout and fire is burnt outside to open the sides of the canoe. Finally, wide boards are added to complete this traditional seagoing vessel. Rafts called Pui Pui are also made for fishing close to the shore. The houses of the Kalinago were made of posts, saplings, reeds and palm fronds. Inside the houses were hammocks for sleeping, storage baskets and calabashes. Their staple food was the manioc or cassava. Today, as in the past, the cassava roots are first peeled and grated. Then the grated cassava is left to stand in water, and then it is squeezed to extract the toxic juice. The grated cassava is next heated over a fire to dry it out and to produce cassava flour or farine and the cassava, the traditional bread of the Kalinago. One of the most enduring skills of the Kalinago people is the making of baskets. Long thin reeds of the Laruma plant are cut and dried and then stripped to provide weaving material. Some of the Laruma is soaked in mud to dye the strands black. With a skill handed down from generation to generation over thousands of years, Kalinago artisans produce a wide variety of basketry and other woven craftwork. The volcanic landscape of Waitukubuli provided geological formations that feature in the Kalinago mythology. The L'Escalier Tetche at Sinicu 
was believed to be the site where the master bow constrictor first came out of the sea. On the Pegua rock, legend says, that a magical flower grows, and by bathing with it in the river below, you can command whosoever you wish. The Cachibona islet off the north coast became a magical canoe that took the souls of the dead Kalinago back to South America. For hundreds of years, the Kalinago and their predecessors lived all over Waitukubuli, and just over 40 village sites have already been located. But this society, living in balance with the nature of the island, was soon to change forever. On November 3rd, 1493, Admiral Christopher Columbus, sailing with 17 ships, sighted Waitukubuli and renamed it Dominica. At the Bay of Uyuhuayo, now known as Prince Rupert's Bay, European adventurers began to trade with the Kalinago. The adventurers visited the chief in his village on the Indian River to trade for tobacco and fruit. But guns, steel and disease took their toll. The Kalinago fought back to hold on to this, the last of their islands. But once the French and later the British possessed Dominica, their defeat was complete. When the British took over Dominica in 1763, they divided the island into lots for sale, and the Kalinago retreated to the rugged east coast, where a plot of just 134 acres had been left for them. Here they lived in relative isolation from the colonial society for almost 150 years. Then, on July the 4th, 1903, a British administrator, Hesketh Bell, declared the establishment of a 3,700-acre Carib reserve, and he officially recognized the Carib chief. Since those days, the Kalinago people gradually reasserted themselves politically and culturally within the island society, at times resisting the colonial power, as in the case of the Carib Rising of the 19th of September 1930, led by Chief Jolly John. When Dominica gained political independence from Britain in 1978, a Carib Reserve Act was passed to provide legislation for the administration of the territory. A Carib Council, headed by a chief, now administers the area. Since independence, a new generation of Kalinago people have sought to rediscover their past, while at the same time using the technology of the present to advance their cause. Here, the skills and traditions of the past are being harnessed to provide a new life and a new future for the indigenous people of Waitukubuli.